Good afternoon. Um, we have quite a long history of this. Depends how you look at it, though. If you look at rights expression languages, if you have a look at copyright notices and so on, we haven't done it. We haven't touched that specifically within W3C. But we have spent a lot of effort over the years on applying metadata to web pages and websites. If you have a definition of a website, we'd love to know what it is. We don't have one. I don't think anyone really has a definition of a website. It's, a, it's an intangible thing. Um, our very first standard, uh, uh, the W3C was formed in October 1994, coup for 20th anniversary coming up next year. Um, the very first standard that was released was PNG, the uh, graphics format, which is just overtaking GIF on the web as being uh, um, the, the, the most important standard for um, graphics as opposed to um, uh, images. The second standard that W3C produced was this, and my guess is you've never heard of it. And there is why it should have done, don't worry. And it's a standard that was designed to apply metadata to websites. It looked like this. This is a PIX label, Platform for Internet Content Selection. Don't learn this syntax. It's, um, it's just to give you an example of the kind of thing it did. But this includes, this includes who produced this metadata, um, when they produced it, when it's valid until, where it covers, um, and you could apply any metadata you like to an individual page or to an entire website or a section of a website. That was all done back in 1996. You'll notice there are no angle brackets in this particular bit of um, uh, code. That's because this is older than XML. XML hadn't been invented when we did PIX in 1996. It's that old. Around right about the time this had been developed, Microsoft decided that this web thing might be worth having a look at, and they had their new browser, Internet Explorer 3, and they wanted to show that their browser was better than Netscape. So they implemented a PIX label reader within Internet Explorer 3. And it's still there today. It's certainly in IE9. It may still, I don't know if it's in IE10. I haven't seen IE10 yet to check. And although this is designed to allow to put any metadata about any subject into any web page, what it actually got used for was for child protection and flagging up adult content. Therefore, the PIX reader in Internet Explorer is called Content Advisor, and it's to stop your kids looking at porn. My introduction to W3C and the world of web standards was, was I was working for the organization that generated these labels for many years. That's how I came to do this kind of thing. Um, the reason you'd never heard of it was because it was a complete failure. No one uses it. Right? The only people that ever built a PIX label reader were Internet Explorer and Netscape in 4.7, and they took it out in 6. Right? No one uses it. But didn't it do what you wanted to do? It gave you a way to apply metadata. You could have used this to say, this is copyright me. I'm asserting this on this date. Uh, you could build a PIX label reader that would prevent access, that would flag things up, that would say, do you know that this thing you're looking at here is not yours? Belongs to AP or whoever it belongs to. You could have done that in 1996, and no one did. This is P3P, the platform for privacy preferences. Another one, another attempt to engage between the content producer and the end user. This is about um, the content provider would say, if you use this service, I'm going to capture your name and your email address and perhaps whatever it is. If you're, so this was in the early days of e-commerce, letting the user know, empowering the user in terms of what this site was going to take and what they were going to do with it. And you could, again, in Internet Explorer 6, they built this thing in, and you could say, okay, I don't mind giving away my email address, I don't want to give away my real address, I don't mind this, I'll allow this to happen. Quite a sophisticated system. It's built in IE6, taken out in IE7, I think, I'm not sure, it may still be there. But P3P was developed in that way, um, and it allowed, again, communication between the content provider and the end user, and there was some interaction with a tool in the browser that allowed the user to have some control. Um, it was one of those rare occasions when we actually put the, the message and the technology that transmitted the message together in one. The only way you could convey a P3P message was to use the protocol that came with it. The only, way, uh, the only message you could get using the P3P protocol was the privacy message. 
You could do it through, uh, it was done through an HTTP header. So there was a, uh, again, there was a human readable version and a machine readable version. The machine readable version was very compact and was designed to be sent out as an HTTP response header. My guess is you haven't heard of P3P, you probably never used it. Didn't give up on PIX though. PIX didn't stop, PIX didn't die. The people who worked on PIX thought, you know, there's a lot of stuff here, we can do this, we can, we can do something interesting here. So they invented PIX Next Generation. So 1997, this is a document, all our documents are always on the web, they'll outlive all of us, this is still there. This is PIXNG, PIX Next Generation. And one of the people involved in PIXNG was Aura Lassel. I was speaking to Jan earlier on who is also a Finnish semantic web expert and Aura Lassler was one of the original people who came up with the name semantic web in an article with Tim Berners-Lee and Jim Hendler in, use in uh, Scientific American in 2001. PIXNG evolved into RDF. RDF is our way of doing data at web scale. It's our way of describing anything. It's our way of conveying information about other things. It's our way of modeling the world at web scale. It's based on URIs as identifiers, not necessarily HTTP URIs. You can have an ISBN as an, as it has an identifier, you have all sorts of things. But it should be persistent, um, and it's a way of using identifiers for people and buildings and concepts and roads and whatever it may be, and modeling the world. And RDF allows you to do that, and you can do some very exciting things with RDF. That's been around uh, in its modern form since 2004. We built various technologies on top of that. Uh, it's a very, it, it's now, we, the, the discussion we're having internally is have we actually finished it? And we think in large, in large part we have um, with the other things that have been built on, on, on top of RDF. So RDF, I'd say, is one of our big successes. Maybe not quite the scale of HTML, but it's certainly a successful thing. And it came from that PIX uh, thing that we started talking about way back. Uh, Jonas has already mentioned that you can embed RDF data within an HTML document. This is RDFA or RDF annotations, and you've seen examples of that. I don't need to uh, go on about that, but it's um, you know it's it's in HTML5. It's 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 there. It's, it's it's no problem. Now earlier on, we were talking about wouldn't it be nice if we could say these restrictions, which could be very fine grained, these fine grained restrictions apply to this section of this website. This particular image has this license attached to it, and everything else, unless otherwise said above, has this license. This can do that. Powder can do that. Powder officially superseded PIX as the way in which you would describe data, in which you would describe websites. Um, it's extremely well written. The person who chaired this working group and wrote all the specs, he's, a, he's, he's just fantastic. I can't remember his name at the moment. Um, but it, it does exactly what you're asking about. Can you say, in a, and it was designed to go into commercial workflows. <clears throat> it was designed so the person that wrote the metadata was not the person that took the picture, that wrote the article, that everything else. Somebody would have the job of editing the file that said, okay, uh, here's something specific, here's something specific, and then everything else is like this. And you can label, you can describe bits of the, state, bits of the site over here separately from, from over there. And because it's actually expressed in XML, in a limited form of XML, which you can then process using XSLT to get into RDF. So you can process it as XML, you can process it as RDF, and it does a lot of what you want to do right down to the level of this image here has a different license to the text around it, or this bit of text has a different license to the text around that. All that's possible. Nobody uses it. Okay, like pics, no one uses it. It's, there. it's been there since 2009. It does what you want it to do. You could, you could hook this up to ODRL or WriteSML, and I'm sure there'd be a way to do it. And I'd be delighted if that conversation were to happen. Uh, as far as I know, there are three implementations of Powder. I built one, my mate built the other one, and there's another guy in America who built the third. <coughs> so, in all these cases, it's providing information from the content provider to the end user and expecting the end user to do something about it. And the end user doesn't. The end user couldn't care less. The end user didn't set up their PIX filter. The end user didn't set up their privacy preferences in, in IE6. So can we switch that around? 
And can we switch it so that the onus is now on the content provider to do something different? Because the, the user has said, look, listen to me, I'm saying yes or I'm saying no or I do want this or I don't want that. When I used to work in online safety, this was something that we talked about. Should the, the user be able to, when they make a request to the web for a page, should they be able to say, I'll take anything you like, but don't give me porn or don't give me, or give me porn, whatever it may be. But you would be able to put the, put the onus on, the, on the, the content provider to respond to a message from the user. And we are experimenting with this. This is the do not track preference thing. Um, the next World Wide Web conference is in Rio de Janeiro in May, and I get to go, which is fantastic. And I spent about a minute during a conference call trying to find a hotel in Rio. I use booking.com. A bit later on, I checked my Facebook page. Adverts, hotels in Rio, down the Facebook page, because I happened to look for 30 seconds. Right, I'm being tracked, okay, because I haven't set the do not track thing. Do not track is really, really sophisticated, mega complicated standard. It's one for don't track me and zero for I don't mind. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the debates going on about <coughs> which is the default and what do you do when there's neither. That's where the trouble is. This is easy. Now, Microsoft decided, okay, here's RE10, DNT, on by default. <coughs> no, big problems. The DNT working group has the marketeers in the same room as the browser manufacturers. Great, let's all come together. Let's try and make this work so that the user has an experience that is controlled. It's not the same as rights management, I understand that, but the, the ideas behind it are very similar to the ones that we're talking about here today. It's the nearest I can get. So maybe you want to have a conversation with the browser manufacturers in the same room as you, the enormous content providers. And then is Google a browser manufacturer? Well, yes, but they're also a content and, you know, quite where Google sits in your landscape, I'm not sure. But DNT is technically trivial, politically anything but. It's a, it's a real ongoing issue. And uh, my boss spends most of the time uh, handling it in one way or another. Now, over lunch, I was grilling uh, George, I apologize, thank you for all your expert information, because I was given this by one of our two legal people. We have a legal person in, uh, in Europe, uh, Rigo Venning, some of you may know, and in the States it tends to fall on the shoulders of Wendy Seltzer. And I was talking to Wendy, I said, I'm going to go and th just talk to the IPTC, what do I not say, how can I make sure I don't make a complete fool of myself? She said, well, th th this is, you know, don't forget this. If you transmit data, if you transmit rights information with your images, with your text, whatever it may be, there's absolutely no guarantee whatsoever that the user has received it. Neither is there any guarantee the user has understood it. There's no guarantee the data will arrive uncorrupted. And there's no guarantee that the data that you're sending has legal force. Now, having grilled George on this and said, well, what about this? He said, well, <laughs> it depends. Right? You, can, you can go along and along and along as you like. Ultimately, the answer is it depends and depends on so many different factors. So just simply expressing a rights language doesn't mean anyone's going to use it, and it doesn't mean to say it has legal force. Now, you might have legal force, but you don't necessarily automatically have legal force. And you can't make the leap from markup to legal fact in all cases. Now, W3C famously is never ever going to do anything about DRM, honestly. No, we're never going to do DRM. <clears throat> Okay, uh, this is the encrypted media extensions draft. This is not, I mean, it's public. All our work's in public. We don't have anything behind closed doors these days. But um, this is, uh, what I mean by it's not published yet, I mean it's, it's publicly available, but it isn't, on the rec isn't formally on the recommendations path yet. There's a, there's a process you go through. At the bottom, the people who are editing the encrypted media extensions, um, this is an, that is an extension to HTML5. Uh, Google, Microsoft, and Netflix. So you can see where this is coming from. This is, um, I'll put the, the, the important text on the screen. This is not a DRM system, but it is a license key exchange system. What, it, what we're trying to say is that whatever DRM system you have, you can implement however you like, and you may have your own DRM server or whatever. That's up to you, and we honestly don't want to touch that. That's, that's the third rail for us. But we recognize there might be a way if you want to exchange um, some sort of encrypted key or a license information or whatever. And uh, this emerging standard is uh, a step towards that. But even that, I don't know if that's actually the answer to your question. Can you actually prevent somebody copying something? No, you can't. 
If I can see it on my screen, I can copy it. In fact, if you know how the web, the browser works, if you can see it on a screen, you already have a copy. It's, it's on your machine. And it's copied to every machine between the origin server and yourself. So the idea that there's only one copy is, is, is technically naive. Um, so th th there are ways around this, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure that uh, th even this is an answer. The only answer surely can be that all the parties are interested. And going back to Thomas's speech earlier on, um, and, and my question after it was, you know, you can produce all the rights languages you like. You can make them perfect, a perfect expression down to the detail of what you can and can't do with something. You can use Creative Commons licenses, which we like very much. I regard as a huge success story, and I'm a big fan of CC. But if the person at the end doesn't want to know or isn't listening, then I don't know you're going to achieve a great deal. So expressing, expressing things is easy. Getting people to listen and to act on it, you actually have to have their willingness and their desire to take part. And that's the hard part. Thank you. Thank you.